in fact, Bob cast that copy machine for sound. Uh, he auditioned lots of copying machines, and he wanted a copy machine that would have a kind of musical rhythm to it. In post-production, in fact, we tried to augment the sound of that copy machine. Bob was nice enough to listen to our attempts, but he said, nope, I like the original one that I cast, and so that's the one we used. Bob wanted the red square sequence to be as authentic as possible. The people who were on location when they shot the scene did their best to collect sounds, but as you can imagine, it was pretty tense trying to shoot in red square, and so they didn't get as many sounds as we needed, and so we had to go looking for the sounds of the bells uh, that you hear in red square. We brought in people who pretended to be tour guides, who you never really see in the scene, but you hear off screen doing a tour via a megaphone. Let's go, unlock, oh, get him out of there. Right here, two lines, two lines, one to the airport truck, one to the Moscow truck. Got it? CDG, FE, ME, Memphis, on the airport truck, everything else right there, Nikolai. Tick tock, tick tock, four minutes. We tried to use as much of what's called production sound as we could in terms of the dialogue. The production sound is the sound that is recorded while the camera's rolling of the actors speaking. Even these scenes uh, on the uh, airplane early in the film, uh, most of them are production sound. I'd say 90% of the time, the quality of the actor's performance during production is better than what you get with ADR, which stands for Automated Dialogue Replacement, which is the actor coming in in post-production and trying to speak in sync with him or herself. Cell this phone. scene is very much a dialogue scene. And you typically decide when you're doing the sound for a scene in a movie what the principal driving factor is going to be. And sometimes the, what's driving the scene can shift from dialogue to music to sound effects in terms of the sound within a scene. But this scene is very much a dialogue scene, and so we wanted the dialogue to predominate, and we didn't want the sound of the airplane to grab your attention, and we didn't want you to be thinking about the airplane particularly. And so the sound is more or less monotone for the whole scene. Stan, I'm so sorry I wasn't around when Mary died. I should have been there for you, and I wasn't. I'm so sorry. Foley is the sound effect equal of ADR. Foley is a process invented by a guy named Jack Foley, or at least popularized by Jack Foley, in which you record certain kinds of sound effects while you're watching the scene on a screen in a studio. For instance, at the beginning of the scene between Tom and Helen Hunt, when they have their day planners, the first thing you hear is the slap down of those day planners. Okay, I'll cancel Saturday. No, don't, don't. If I'm not here, I'm not. And that's partly a production sound effect that was recorded when the cameras were rolling, and it's partly a Foley sound. One of the things that we try to do with the sound in a film is to focus attention. One of the things that you can listen for when you're watching a film is what sounds are played loudly and what sounds are played quietly. Because it won't necessarily follow exactly what you see on the screen. But just as a camera is able to shift its focus from one point of view to another, sound can shift focus also. No, no. One of the things that we do when we mix a film is to decide as we go along, what's important, what isn't important, what should be loud, what should be quiet, and we have control over all of the different elements. Okay, people. Well, usually the goal in sound is to have people not notice anything in particular, because if you start thinking about the sound, then by definition you're not really in the story anymore. We filmmakers refer to it as taking someone out of the film if you remind them somehow of the filmmaking process. Uh, that can be especially a danger when you're putting sounds into the surround channels uh, in a film because since the convention in films is to hear the dialogue coming from the center of the uh, screen, if you put a line of dialogue or a very transient sound, you know, something that comes and goes quickly, into one of the surround speakers, many people will turn their heads 
and say, oh, what was that? Is there a bird in the movie theater? And then they think, oh, oh yeah, the, the sound effects people put that there. Well, that's the last thing the filmmaker wants to happen. The filmmaker wants you to be in the dream of the film and not be thinking about how the film was made when you're watching it. So we have to be pretty careful about placing sounds for that reason. The mix for this film, uh, including what's called pre-mixing, which means putting sounds into certain categories, and also the final mix, in which you're literally mixing together the sound effects and the music and the dialogue, the way it's going to sound in the movie theater, uh, was about six weeks. And that's six weeks of roughly nine or ten hour days. Uh, it was a pretty straightforward and, and not particularly difficult mix, actually, uh, partly because of this temp mixing process uh, where we learn a lot about what works and what doesn't work. Uh, so Apocalypse Now was mixed for nine months, for instance. <laughs> but Apocalypse Now didn't have many temp mixes. <laughs> I've learned by doing lots of scenes like this that the main thing you want to accomplish is to get rid of everything that you don't need. One of the myths about mixing the sound for a big action sequence in a film is that you want the biggest sound mixing console possible so that you can plug as many sounds into it as possible to mix them all together. And in fact, that's really not what should happen at all, because in a scene like this crash sequence, we have hundreds and hundreds of sounds that have been recorded and edited to go in this. And if you were to play them all at the same time, it would sound like you were standing in the middle of Niagara Falls. Uh, it would be what we call pink noise, just roar, sort of meaningless roar. For instance, when the big FedEx package suddenly shifts position, we need to hear that sound mostly rather than the roar of the airplane around it or the whistling of the wind or the banging of the things in the background. What we do is either get rid of or reduce in volume all those other sounds so that we can concentrate on the FedEx package scraping across the floor and banging into the uh, end of the airplane. have an underwater scene, you usually have a lot of latitude to play it as the point of view of the character. It's easy to assume that everything that you're seeing and hearing is what he's seeing and hearing. We might hear only bubbles at a certain moment. Another moment, we might be hearing mainly the creaking of the metal. And if you were to actually record the sounds that you see there, in fact, they would be very different from what we put in the film. But what we put in is valid because it's the way Chuck is experiencing. It's what he's hearing and what he's feeling. So we can use sound in a very musical, kind of dramatic way. The storm transition was a very important part of the movie. Bob designed it uh, from the beginning such that we probably weren't going to see a lot of the transition. Instead, we would hear it almost as if it were a radio play. And what we had to suggest with sound is that what you see and hear in the movie over about a 30 second period had to suggest a maybe two or three hour period of the storm going by and the rain and him drifting along and finally we realize as we hear the raft being punctured and we see the raft up against these rocks oh I see he's in a different place now that's a difficult thing to do I started working in sound in radio and produced some radio plays and when I started working in film, I tended to be sort of disgruntled thinking, why do we always have to worry about the camera? It's such a hassle. But now that I've worked in film for a long time, I find that when I 
occasionally do go back and do something for the radio, like a radio play, I'm thinking, wow, I wish I had the visuals to lean on a little more <laughs> because it's hard to tell a story just with sound. And so trying to do that for Castaway, do the storm sequence almost like a radio play was very much like that. One of the most difficult sound sequences to create, believe it or not, uh, for the island was when Chuck first arrives on the island and he wakes up in the raft and things are very quiet, but you see and hear these waves lapping up onto the beach. Those waves were very difficult to create and make believable. We weren't able to use the production sound because there was pounding surf off in the distance and we didn't want to hear that. We wanted it to be very quiet to contrast with the loud sequence that had come before. And so we had to record each of these waves individually and not only get the sound of the impact of the wave, but also get the waves that just sort of slide up onto the beach without any impact and that kind of fizzing sound when the waves slide back down the coral sand beach. It was an enormous effort to try to not only collect all of those sounds, but to edit them together in a way that you would really believe. And uh, it took a lot of trial and error to, to get it just right. None of these sounds that you hear as Chuck is trying to get through the surf uh, were simply recordings of surf. Uh, we've tried to do that in the past on similar films that had surf sequences and the sound that you get is just noise. So what you have to do is manufacture each wave out of quite a diverse group of elements to make it sound like a wave, but sound like an even bigger wave than it looks like, and keep it articulate and wet and, and identifiable as a wave. We have Foley, which did the sound of Chuck maneuvering the oars, moving through the water. We have him yelling things, which was ADR. We have the sound of the raft creaking. We have impacts of the waves onto the raft and the raft kind of thunderously hitting the water after each wave has hit it. The impacts are made from a combination of explosions, dynamite explosions, mortar explosions, all kinds of explosions that have nothing to do with waves and the sound of people jumping into the water, doing a kind of cannonball and making that kind of sound. We wanted the ADR to sound like it was production, which would have been recorded outside, so we wanted to simulate the sound of outdoor acoustics. And one of the ways to do that is to take a recording that's made in a studio and then play it through speakers outside and set up another microphone and re-record it. So we decided to do that here at Skywalker Ranch. We had recordings that were very clean and dry, as we say, without any natural reverberation on them that were made in a studio of Tom Hanks yelling, help, over here. And we played those through a speaker here at Skywalker Ranch. We thought where maybe nobody would hear them, but people did hear them. And so the security department of the ranch showed up and said, you know, what's happening? You know, somebody in danger, but uh, nobody was in danger, and we shooed them away and, and continued our uh, recording. Hey! Ship! Hey! 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 Hey, ship! Over here! Hey! Hey! The initial dialogue that we hear off screen of Tom as, we're, as the camera is panning from left to right is all ADR. 
Uh, but when we get to Tom and actually see him, that's production sound. And that's a tricky thing to pull off. It means that in the ADR session, when Tom came into a studio in post-production to redo that dialogue, he also had to have something in his mouth. Otherwise, it wouldn't have sounded the same. So he had to come really close to simulating exactly what he was doing when the camera was rolling in order for you not to say, hey, how come his voice changed completely right there for no reason? I did think I used to avoid going to the dentist like a flurb. I put it off every single chance I got. And now, oh, what I wouldn't give to have a, a dentist right here in this cave. In fact, I wish you were a dentist. Yeah. Dr. Wilson. Wind and rain and water are very hard sounds to record. Wind is hard because it's hard to keep the sound out of the microphone. When you're recording wind, you're typically recording the sound of the air moving across some other object like the leaves of a tree or through telephone wires or around the edge of a building. And what you don't want to hear is the wind blowing through the microphone. And so there are lots of tricks that you can use. One is called a wind screen, which goes around the microphone itself. But in addition to that, you often have to hold up blankets or other objects between the microphone and the wind so that the microphone can pick up mainly the effect that the wind is having on other objects and not the wind blowing through it. It's a big story point that we need to hear this wind change fairly abruptly at a certain point and that signals him that, okay, now is the time to launch the raft. So we had to create one set of winds, which are the winds that are blowing from out to sea onto shore, and another set of winds that blow from the shore out to sea so that you could tell sonically, ah, oh, that's there's the change. So you, in fact, you see the change happening because you see the leaves on the trees in the background shifting directions when the change happens. But we also needed to hear the change happen. In the old days of radio plays, they often used uh, big sheets of metal uh, being shaken and maneuvered to simulate the sound of thunder. Uh, unfortunately, that's fairly identifiable as what it is to our modern ears, so we can't get away with that anymore. So we almost always use actual thunder. Uh, the big trick with thunder is that it's it's the holy grail of thunder to have a thunder recording with no rain on it. Because most of the thunder that we hear, of course, is accompanied by rain. But very often you want to be able to hear thunder without hearing any rain. And so there are occasionally sound recordists happen to get a crack of thunder with no rain. And so uh, whenever we hear that somebody has one of those, we gobble it up like you know, ravenous wolves. One of the challenging decisions that Bob made early on was that he decided there should be no sound of birds or insects or frogs on the island. Initially, I felt like, wow, I have a straight jacket on. That really limits the palette that I have to work with. 
because typically if you're editing the sound for an outdoor sequence, uh, it's, you have birds at your disposal. You can decide whether they're happy sounding birds or threatening sounding birds. And likewise with insects, I was thinking maybe uh, we would have uh, kind of dark sinister sounding cicadas or something like that on the island when it was appropriate to have that feeling. My concern was, well, geez, we're going to have to like remove birds if they fly through the frame. And it turned out there are no birds. So we did have some flies, though. We had to take flies out in the computer every once in a while. We couldn't have any animals on the island because then he would have trapped them and eaten them. But when Bob said, you know, I don't think we should have uh, any of that stuff, it, it sent me into a minor panic because I knew that all I would have to work with w on the island in terms of sound effects would be wind and waves and the sound of Tom Hanks moving around. In the end, it proved that that was probably the best decision because if there had been the sound of birds and insects and frogs on the island, I think just like with the orchestra, it would have made you feel in a way like Chuck was not alone. Sometimes the things that you think are gonna be the easiest are the most difficult because you don't really realize how complex they are. And to try to get the sound of all of those palm fronds moving at just the right time and rubbing against each other proved to be quite a bit tougher than I thought it was going to be. And even after the initial editing, we had to go back and re-edit some more palm fronds and re-record some more to make it believable. probably have 15 or 20 different sound sources. I try to uh, keep it as few as possible. We, we try to initially make some decisions about what works and what doesn't work rather than arriving at the final mix with hundreds of sounds for every scene, which is what some sound editors do. And so in, in this scene, we had a mere you know, 15 or 20 simultaneous sound sources. Uh, we have three or four surf sounds going on simultaneously for the distant surf. We have the uh, sound of the wind in the palm trees. We have the sound of him rubbing the stick on the other stick to try to start the fire. We have the sound of his breaths and grunts and efforts. All of that is ADR, his other miscellaneous Foley movements. So it's 15 or 20 separate sounds. Since we knew we weren't going to be able to put birds or insects or frogs on the island, one sound that occurred to me that we could put in that would give us a little bit bigger palette to work with in terms of sound is the sound of the palm trees creaking when the wind blows through them. So we recorded all kinds of sounds, including um, the sound of a cat carrier that one of the Foley people had that happened to make great creaking sounds when you twisted it. It was a wicker cat carrier. We recorded uh, pieces of wood being twisted that made creaking sounds. We also used the sound of footsteps on a wooden floor. We just went looking for all kinds of creaking. It makes the place seem a little bit more lonely, maybe even a little bit sinister moments when we wanted it to be sinister for Tom being all alone there. And there's something about the sound of creaking that tells us maybe there's something to worry about. In this scene after Chuck's reception party, we wanted to play with the sounds of civilization in kind of a sad or mournful way. You hear a distant siren in the streets of Memphis. In addition to the rain, we don't hear very much except uh, the sound of the refrigerator. We hear it a little bit louder when the refrigerator doors open. got whole milk. Two percent and nine thousand. And we, we you know, cut in the sound of things kind of rattling inside the refrigerator when the door is open, and then obviously the sound of the refrigerator door closing. All of that is is uh, faked sound, if you will. It's not production sound. 
this fire starting sequence was quite a challenge. Uh, none of the sound that you hear in the fire starting sequence was recorded on the island or while the cameras were rolling. Trying to manipulate the stick was really hard to keep it in sync with what you see on the screen because it's very fast movement uh, at, during some parts of it. So the Foley people especially uh, deserve a huge amount of credit for making this fire starting sequence as believable as it is in terms of the sound. The sound of the fire is tricky, especially for that first little puff of fire, because actually if you record that event happening, you don't really hear much sound. And so it's one of the little bits of artistic license that we take with movies that we want to hear a sound. <laughs> The sound is actually a much bigger fire uh, being blown by the wind. And we just took a piece of that recording of the little puff of wind in a bigger fire and made that sync with the, uh, the onset of this little flame as he's successful in blowing the, uh, the kindling. People who do a lot of watching of movies in home theaters love to hear sounds in the surrounds and they love to hear sounds panned over to the left and over to the right because it really gives this equipment that they've bought for their homes a workout. But panning sounds in a scene like this where he's lying by the fire eating the crab can be a dangerous thing because this scene is mostly shot in what's called reverses. You see the fire in the foreground and you see Tom Hanks in the background eating the crab. And then the next moment, you're looking back at Wilson, who's at the other side of the campfire. And so what happens is if you pan the fire all the way over to the right, when you're looking at Tom Hanks, then when you go to the reverse angle shot, suddenly the fire is all the way over on the left. There's something that can be really jarring about that. Even though it's literally true, it's one of those things that can remind people they're watching a movie because initially you think, why did the sound of the campfire jump from the right side of the theater to the left side of the theater? And you have to stop and think, oh, I see, it's because we're in the reverse angle now and that's not what the filmmaker wants you to be thinking. So in that scene, we kept the sound of the campfire more or less in the center the whole time because we didn't want it to be jumping around the theater from shot to shot. The environment of the cave was fun to play with because even though we didn't have insects or frogs or birds to hear, in the cave we could hear drops of water. We could hear water flowing because there's supposed to be a little spring in the cave and we hear water flowing through the cave when it's raining. We also hear the sound of the surf outside the cave and we can take all of those sounds that we recorded separately and then put them into a digital reverberation program that makes it sound like they're all inside of a cave. We didn't do any uh, tooth banging recording as part of this. What, the main thing that you hear is the rock hitting on the skate. And I think that metallic sound uh, really uh, sets people's teeth on edge, so to speak, because you can really identify with what that must have felt like. It was quite a challenge to figure out how to do this four-year transition. In a way, it's probably the most sound design-y moment in uh, Castaway because we actually have some sort of sound morphing going on. What I did was to take a kind of roaring fire sound, not so much crackling, but just a low-frequency roaring, and take water lapping which I processed so that it had no high frequencies in it at all. So it was also just a kind of low, almost roaring sound. And crossfade between the fire roaring and the water roaring. And then gradually we allow the higher frequencies of the water to pass through so that over a period of uh, 10 seconds or so, what sounds like roaring fire turns into water.
when he's inside the cave and initially hears the porta potty outside, we added quite a bit of artificial reverberation to that to make it sound more like it was coming from a distance. We used a real porta potty. <laughs> Uh, we uh, bought a used porta potty, which we arranged to get clean, cleaned as quick as possible, and we recorded it. Uh, we twisted it and banged it with rocks and rubbed it up against rocks and trees and various other things, trying to get this sound of it scraping against the rocks outside the cave. And as usual, played a variety of things that we had done for Bob and to see what he liked and what he didn't like, and eventually we, we found a set of sounds that really seemed to work. So then the trick to that was to try to use sounds once we cut outside that would be similar enough to the ones that we used when you're inside the cave so that you say, aha, that's the same thing. That's what was making that sound. Believe it or not, one of the biggest challenges in Castaway was to come up with the sound of Chuck peeling the bark off of these sticks that he had gathered to make the raft with. You'd think it would be a perfectly simple, straightforward sound to do. Um, and the sound that they recorded on the set was okay, but it had a huge amount of surf behind it. So we had to invent that in post-production and we couldn't find any kind of limb or stick around Skywalker Ranch at least, that we could peel the bark off of that way. So we had to send to Fiji for these hibiscus plants, the very ones that were used in the film, and they had to send them via FedEx, by the way, uh, back to us at Skywalker Ranch, and we still have, I think, 20 or 30 of them around. If anybody needs the uh, sound of hibiscus bark being pulled, I think we're the greatest resource in the world right now. When Chuck finally does make it through that last wave, we hear musical score coming in for the first time in the film. We had heard music before in the film, but it's what's called source music. That is, it's things that people are listening to on the radio or it's pieces of pop music. But here we are almost two thirds of the way through the film and it's the first time we're hearing musical score. That's very unusual in a movie. And uh, Bob Zemeckis thought, I think, from very early on that that's what he wanted to do. And I think it makes a huge impact that way because you haven't heard any music at all for about an hour and a half. And when you hear music, especially this lush score come in out of nowhere in a sense, it has a dramatic effect that it would not have had if you had been hearing music all the way through the island. Almost all of the sound when Chuck is swimming after Wilson um, had to be fabricated in post-production because the production sound, you heard too much of the boats in the background, etc. wasn't really usable for that reason. We uh, had the Foley recordings in which people were pretending to uh, be swimming in the water. We had recordings in the library from people actually swimming around. Um, we had Tom Hanks' uh, ADR, where he was very conscientious about uh, trying to vocalize with a mouth half full of water and simulate what it would have sounded like when uh, he was actually there. And towards the end of the scene, when he realizes he's probably not going to be able to get to Wilson and he sort of gives up and decides to go back to the raft. We cheated all of the sounds even further down, made them even quieter than they were before 
so that the entrance of the music would be clear. Uh, it's just a solo instrument entering as the score begins. And if we had had loud sounds of him thrashing around in the waves and the wind, etc., it would have obscured that piece of music. We wouldn't have been able to hear it and it would, have had the, would not have had the same impact. And so it's just an example of how we're constantly playing with the sounds, controlling the sounds, and deciding from moment to moment what should be loud and what shouldn't be loud. We actually put a lot of thought into the sound design of that scene, believe it or not, even though you wouldn't think of it as a sound design scene. If you listen to the sound, you'll notice that the sound of the crowd in the background, which is initially very loud when he first uh, walks into that FedEx lounge area, goes away. By the time they start talking, and certainly once you get really into their conversation, you hear that crowd almost not at all. And that's fairly unrealistic because you probably would continue to hear them talking because it's obviously hundreds if not thousands of people wandering around out there. And the sounds of the jets going over changes quite a bit as well. We tried to use the sound of the jets in a very musical way. When Kelly's husband is breaking the news to Tom that he is, in fact, her husband, there's a particular sound of a jet uh, taking off and kind of disappearing into the distance that has this kind of low, mournful roar to it. And we put that, that jet in that exact place very much on purpose because it's essentially scoring that scene. It's, it's uh, reflecting what the Chuck character is feeling. But today, one of those sons, Chuck Nolan, has been returned to us. Chuck, welcome home. I'm sorry, I must be in the wrong place. No, you're in the right place. You probably don't remember me. I, I actually did root canal on you about five years ago. Jim Spalding referred you? Oh, yeah. yeah. I'm Kelly's husband. Jerry Lovett. Kelly wanted... Kelly wanted to be here. Uh, oh, look, look, this is very hard I, for everyone. I can't even imagine how hard it is for you. Kelly, uh, she's had it rough. First one, she thought she lost you, and now dealing with all of this, it, it's it's confusing. It's it's very emotional for her. She's... She's... sort of lost. Maybe you could just give her a little more time. Anyway, uh, I'm sorry that... It was artificial rain uh, that was being used in most of these shots. And um, artificial rain is, is kind of notorious because it tends to make some kind of unnatural sounds in terms of the, the machines that are generating the, the rain. I think that there's a device called a rain bird, which is the thing typically used to make artificial rain in a movie. 
we wanted to use the production sound, the sound that was recorded while the camera was rolling, in as much of this scene in Kelly's house as possible, just because the performance was so good. And dramatically, it's a tough scene for the actors to do anyway. So we were stuck with a certain amount of that production noise of the, of the artificial rain falling. And so the mix of this scene was a delicate balance of trying to minimize that artificial rain sound, use actual rain sounds that we had recorded and other rain sounds from our library, that is the sound of the rain, of rain falling on a roof and, and uh, running down gutters, etc. And so it's a pretty delicate weaving of, of the two things, of the production sound that has a little bit of the unfortunate rain sound on it and our effects rain. Let me get one thing straight here. We have a pro football team now, but they're in Nashville. <laughs> the scene inside the garage is a combination of ADR and production sound. And there was a lot of rain, obviously, in that scene. And so what you hear is a combination of uh, post-production rain that we added to the scene and rain that was recorded while the actors were talking. Oh, that trip down to the Gulf. <laughs> so, can I drive it? It's your car. Sound designers do a variety of things depending on what the movie is. On Bob Zemeckis' films, I uh, am in charge of the sound. I report to him. The way that works is that he and I have a couple of conversations before the shooting of the movie even starts. Typically, I've read the script, and so often I'll have an idea to suggest to him about how a scene might be shot in a way to use sound in the best possible way. Usually when we initially meet, we're talking more than anything else about styles. What kind of style should this film have in terms of sound? Just as movies have visual styles, they also have sound styles. So then he goes off and shoots the movie, and when they are finished shooting and they begin editing the film, then uh, I and my team start working to produce sounds to put into the film. Our guidelines were that everything had to be believable. On the other hand, everything has to be as interesting and exciting as it can possibly be to make the film as entertaining and dramatic as possible. One thing that Bob felt sure about from the beginning was that he wanted this film to sound naturalistic. That means real. Even though there are adventure sequences in the movie, it wouldn't have been appropriate for it to sound like an Indiana Jones film, for instance. So we didn't have the latitude to exaggerate the sounds in the way that you would if it were a film like that or a film like The Matrix, for instance. We often think of sound design as spaceship sounds and space alien voices, whooshes and explosions and gunshots. But in fact, the, the deeper meaning of sound design is just trying to tell a story with sound. And so the sound design in a movie like Castaway is really no less sound design than the sound design that you hear in an Indiana Jones film or The Matrix or what have you. It's about working with the director, trying to find ways to use sound in storytelling to help push the story along, to help explain what's happening, to help make connections between characters and places and ideas in the story with sound in the same kinds of ways that those connections are made with visual images. I'm not always thinking about sound, but I am a lot more than the average person. I'm like almost anybody else in that if I like the movie, if I think the movie's good, it's easy for me to lose myself in it and not think about how it was done. But if I don't like the film, or if it hasn't really grabbed my imagination, then I do sit there thinking, hmm, I wonder how they did that, or I wonder why they did that, or, you know, I would have done it a different way, or 
Uh, I wish I knew how they did that because I'd like to be able to do that myself. When I walk down the street and I hear a sound, it's not at all unusual for me to think, I wonder what that would be like if I played it backwards or, uh, or that sound would be great to use in some entirely different way. Um, and you store those things and maybe eventually you go back to that street and collect that sound and, and put it in a movie. Sound tends to be uh, an ignored part of movie making. A lot of the great filmmakers, people like uh, Lucas and Coppola and Spielberg and Kurosawa and others have said that sound in a, in a really good film sound is 50% of the experience. And I think that that's true if the film has really been designed to use sound. One of the first people who did design his films for sound was Orson Welles. And that's partly because he came out of a radio background. He had written in and starred in and directed plays for the radio before he did Citizen Kane. In fact, Citizen Kane was his first film. And they had to give him a crash course in uh, what a close-up was, et cetera, so he could direct this film. But he knew an awful lot about how to use sound to tell stories. And so one of the things that I spend the most time on when I'm working with directors is to try to help them figure out how to use sound in their films. And Bob Zemeckis is somebody who comes to that very naturally. His natural inclination is to use sound. In a way, Castaway is one of the films that's truly designed for sound. <laughs> 